to look for an entrance wound on the left side. One of the nurses rolled the corpse's head to the side. All three nurses were then able to see a cotton-stuffed wound behind the left ear. Several other hospital colleagues subsequently visited the funeral home and made the same observation. The following is an affidavit of Samuel Houston, MD. I have been contacted by six nurses who each described the head wounds of Kathy Ferguson at the open casket funeral and described a small, clean, quarter-size hole with cotton balls stuffed within it behind her left ear and a large blown-out wound to the right temple pulling the right eye over. None of the above nurses saw any wounds on the area of her left temple on careful examination of her head. So according to the testimony of a doctor and six nurses, the bullet may have entered from behind the left ear and exited at the right temple, making Kathy Ferguson's death a possible homicide. Dr. Houston recalled his last conversation with Ferguson on the day before her death. She told him that she wished she did not know as much as she knew concerning the Arkansas State Troopers and their activities and those of Danny Ferguson. Bill Shelton was an Arkansas police officer and boyfriend of Kathy Ferguson. He had been publicly critical of the ruling that stated Kathy's death was a suicide. A month later, Shelton was also shot behind the ear, and his death was also ruled a suicide. In November 1993, Kathleen Willey was leaving the Oval Office from a private meeting with President Clinton when she ran into her friend, Linda Tripp. Willie told Tripp that Clinton kissed her and fondled her. Tripp described Willie as disheveled. Her face was red, her lipstick was off, and she was flustered. Kathleen's husband, Ed Willie, was manager of the Clinton Presidential Finance Committee. He was found shot to death a few hours after his wife's incident with Clinton. The death was ruled a suicide. Newsweek magazine had dropped hints that a former White House staffer was about to go public with her story of sexual harassment at the White House. A few days later, on July 6, 1997, Mary Catron Mahoney and two other employees at Starbucks coffee shop died of gunshot wounds. The restaurant's doors were locked when the victims were found, and nothing appeared to have been stolen, although nearly $4,000 was in the store at the time. Mary Mahoney was shot as many as five times. The Washington Post characterized the crime as an execution-style murder. She had been heavily involved in presidential politics, working on Bill Clinton's campaign in 1992, and served as a White House intern during the first Clinton administration. November 1997. A transmission shop owner opened the trunk of a tornado-ravaged car and found a trunk load of documents. Among them, a 1982 cashier's check for $27,000 payable to Bill Clinton. The source of the funds for the check was the McDougal Savings and Loan. The shop owner, Johnny Lawhon, was reluctant to talk about his discovery. He said, quote, Clinton is the most powerful man in the world, unquote. Lawhon later died in an automobile accident. James McDougall had stated, quote, immediately concurrent with the check being found, I started getting a lot of heat. I am a prisoner of the executive branch, unquote. He was serving a three-year sentence in the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas, and was cooperating with the independent counsel into the investigation of the president. He was scheduled to testify before the grand jury. Against doctor's orders, McDougall was given an injection of Lasix, a diuretic. He was then put in solitary confinement where he died of cardiac arrest. Ron Brown was the target of a major probe headed by independent counsel Daniel Pearson. There were allegations that Brown had received a bribe from a Vietnamese businessman. 
He was also being investigated for numerous scandals by the FBI, the FDIC, a Congressional Oversight Committee, the Energy Department, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and even his own Commerce Department Inspector General. Brown's business partner, Nolanda Hill, would later testify in March 1998 that White House officials wanted him to cover up a scheme involving the sale of U.S. trade mission slots to executives in exchange for contributions for the upcoming Clinton-Gore presidential campaign and the Democratic Party. She said, Ron expressed to me his displeasure that the purpose of the commerce trade missions had been and were being perverted at the direction of the White House. On April 3, 1996, an Air Force Boeing 737 carrying Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 34 others on a trade mission to the Balkans crashed into a hillside near Croatia's Dubrovnik Airport. Air Force procedure called for a two-step investigation. However, for the first time in memory, the Air Force canceled the first step, which called for a safety investigation of a crash on friendly soil. An autopsy on Brown's body would typically have been part of this investigation. They instead went directly to the second and final step, consisting mostly of legal proceedings that would mirror the sentiments of the Pentagon and White House officials, who implied the crash was nothing more than an accident. The Croatian Wire Service reported that the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder had been recovered. Later, the Pentagon disputed this, saying that no voice recorder was on board. But Hillary Clinton flew on the very same aircraft two weeks prior, making it unlikely that a voice recorder would not have been on board. The Air Force concluded that Brown's plane was 10 degrees or almost two miles off course. Maintenance chief Nico Jersik was in charge of the ground beacons and was scheduled to be grilled by the U.S. Air Force accident investigation team. However, he was found shot to death three days following the crash. His death was ruled a suicide. Over three hours after the crash, the first search party arrived on the scene and miraculously found a survivor. Air Force Tech Sergeant Shelley Kelly was found alive and would have helped officials with their investigation into the crash. But she died of a broken neck on the way to a nearby hospital. Lieutenant Steve Cogswell, a forensic pathologist who investigated the crash, contends there is evidence that Ron Brown might have been murdered. He said, quote, Essentially, Brown had a 45 hundredths inch inwardly beveling circular hole in the top of his head, which is essentially the description of a 45 caliber gunshot wound. This man needs an autopsy. This whole thing stinks, unquote. Several personnel were present while Colonel Gormley was conducting his external examination. The photographer present was Chief Petty Officer Kathleen Janoski, a 22-year veteran. I opened up my big mouth in the morgue and said, wow, look at the hole in Ron Brown's head. It looks like a bullet hole. I said that, and my life has never been the same since. All of the X-ray films of Brown's head have disappeared. There were allegedly many photos taken of Brown that were stored in a safe but these photos, along with the negatives, have also disappeared. All that remains of the head x-rays are photographic slide images taken by Janowski. Dr. Cyril Wecht has nearly 40 years of experience, has conducted some 13,000 autopsies, and is considered one of the nation's most prominent forensic pathologists. He is also prominent in Democratic Party politics. He says there was more than enough evidence to suggest a possible homicide in the death of Ron Brown, and an autopsy should have been conducted on his body. As he stated, quote, it's not even arguable in the field of medical legal investigations whether an autopsy should have been conducted on Ron Brown, unquote. And Lieutenant Colonel Cogswell stated, quote, you can't ignore who this person is. To stack up the...